my name is Spencer Rada. I'm the president of the Political Science Club at Norwich University, so right down the road. Uh, so I'm here to be the timekeeper, um, and I will uh, hold these above my head so you know there's a uh, one minute timer, uh, 30 seconds, uh, 10 seconds, and then a stop. Um, and also, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight uh, to hear the candidates and hear what they all have to say. Um, the Political Science Club at Norwich University, uh, we actually just started back up. Um, we've been trying to help students get registered to vote for this upcoming election, make sure they know about the important dates, uh, about um, voter registration, and then also the um, early voting. And we also plan to do trips to the Vermont Capitol and the Vermont Supreme Court in the upcoming semester. So uh, come and talk to us and see us if you'd like to hear a little bit more about us. But um, thank you again for coming out. and. Uh, Let's get, get, let's get to it. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the 2024 Washington County State Senate Candidate Forum. I'm Sue Racanelli, President of the League of Women Voters of Vermont. The League of Women Voters is a trusted, nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse or oppose any party or candidate. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. The League is hosting today's forum with Norwich University Political Science Club and Orca Media. We have six candidates representing Washington County, three incumbents, three challengers, all running for three open seats in the State Senate. This is an opportunity for you, the voter, to meet your candidates, hear what they have to say, and ask questions on issues that are important to you. I'd like to call on Tom McCone, our moderator, to introduce the candidates. Tom is a former English teacher, principal, and library administrator who lives in Montpelier and writes commentary and feature articles for several publications. Tom? Thank you, Sue. Good evening. On that part about being a former teacher and principal, I need to start by telling you that I had the honor for several years of being principal of Northfield Middle and High School. And this is a wonderful place. I've been on this stage before. And it's a pleasure to be back here for this Washington Senate Candidate Forum. Um, so my role as moderator, first, uh, well, we'll start with the process here. The candidates are each going to have uh, two minutes to do an opening statement. I'll be introducing them in a moment, and then they'll have two minutes to do an opening statement. And in the front row, we have Spencer, who is just up here. And he's going to be helping them out, keep, keeping track of how much time they have left. So we have two after the opening statements. The League of Women Voters have written two questions. The candidates received the first question in advance. They have not received the second question and not seen it. I have additional questions uh, from community members, questions that people have given us this evening. And uh, I have some from past forums, but we won't need them because I think we're going to have plenty from people right here. So that's, that's great. Um, after the questions, the two questions from the league, we really want to have questions from people in the audience. And if uh, Sonia over here has note cards, and if you uh, would like to write a question on a note card, please give that to her. Jez is organizing them, so he gives me the cards. If we get three or four questions on the same topic, we will combine those in some way, and we won't ask them three or four times. So uh, candidates do not need to take the full two minutes. Uh, if they take less time, that allows us to fit more questions in. So, But you have up to two minutes. Uh, I'll be calling on the candidates in a uh, random order. I've already worked out a, a grid. They, each of the candidates will have the opportunity to go first and to go last and have each of the uh, positions in between. And they will be going in a, a mixed order, so they will not be going immediately before or after the same person more than once. Okay. 
If you would, I'm going to I'll read the uh, names and identifications of the six candidates. And uh, when they're doing their opening statements and answering questions, if you'd refrain from applauding, that allows us to keep, uh, keep the pace going. And at the end, you will have a, an opportunity to, to thank all of the candidates. The candidates are seated in the same order in which they're listed from left to right in the order that they're listed on the ballot. We have Ann Cummings, Democrat from Montpelier, Michael Deering II, Republican from Barry City, Michael Mike Doyle, Republican from Montpelier, Donald Koch, Republican from Barry Town, Andrew Perchlick, Democrat and Progressive from Marshfield, and Ann Watson, Democrat, Democrat and Progressive from Barry City. And so on to opening statements. So uh, Donald will be going first, and after him, it will be Ann Cummings. So Donald, you have two minutes. My name is Donald Koch. I'm a lifelong resident of Barry, born and educated right here in central Vermont. I am an Eagle Scout and learned many leadership skills through the Boy Scouts and in college at Johnson State College where I majored in psychology and studied legislative process under the late Senator Bill Doyle. I'm not unfamiliar with Vermont politics. My father served for 22 years as a representative from the town of Barrie. And I am currently the chair of the Washington County Republicans. I have been exposed to the issues my entire life and desire to help protect our most cherished traditions and help make Vermont a place where we can continue to thrive. Vermont is at a tipping point. We are being taxed from all directions by the Democrat progressive-led supermajority, which refuses to work with the governor or reach across party lines to achieve reasonable solutions. People and businesses are finding it difficult to re remain in Vermont and are leaving and taking their wealth with them before they lose it. Something needs to change. One of the things Senator Doyle instilled in me is the importance of communication and connection with the people. I'm sure many of us remember his Doyle polls, and he had an uncanny way of being everywhere at any one time. I believe I am well suited to represent the people because I am an ordinary citizen and a business owner. I understand the people because I struggle with them. I am one of them. I know what it is like to struggle to pay the bills at the end of the week. I will make three commitments which will guide my decision making if I am elected to represent you. First, I will always tell the truth. Second, I will keep in contact with the voters and I ask the people to do the same with me. Third, I will not vote for a bill which I cannot understand well enough to explain to the voters. I respectfully ask for your support. Give change a chance for a brighter Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Ian Cummings is next, and then Andrew Perchlick. Ian? Okay, thank you, and thank you for coming out. I'm Ann Cummings. Um, I live in Montpelier. I'm old. I've been in the Senate a long time. Um, we, had, we lost five senior senators this year, two deaths and three retirements, and so I am the dean of the Senate, which means I've survived the longest which is kind of a shock to me because I've always sat next to Senator Doyle. I also sat next to our present governor for 10 years, and we always worked well together. Communications between the legislature and the governor is a two-way street. I consider myself a traditional Democrat, a Kennedy Roosevelt Democrat. I don't have any particular agendas or issues that I am there to push or ideologies. I believe my job is to listen to you, to hear, to hear the concerns, and then make the best decisions I can for what is best for the people of Vermont, you know, according to the information I have at, at that time. If I get more information later on, then I, I will adjust um, where I, what I do. But I, I try and stay in touch, and I, you know, email seems to be the big thing, and I hope 
you'll all you know, find me, talk to me, and help me do a, a good job of representing you. Thank you, Ann. Andrew is next, and he'll be followed by Mike Deering. Great, thanks. So yeah, I'm Andrew Perchlick. I live in Marshfield. I'm asking for one of your three votes for state senate. This would be my fourth term if, if re-elected this time. And the reason I think that I should get one of your votes is I have a strong interest in the policies that will make for a better Vermont. I study political science involved in the political science club in my own college. My father taught civics and social studies in high school and political science. My mom was a real estate agent and very active in the community. As Senator Cummings could tell you, real estate agents learn a lot about their communities and the people in there. So I was just raised with a real interest in how things were happening on a very local level. Uh, when, I moved to Marsh, when I moved to Vermont, first of all, I was a VISTA volunteer, worked on a low-income weatherization program and was in a lot of homes throughout Vermont and working on what it's like to not be able to heat your house and how we are going to help these people heat their, heat their homes. I was also on the select board in Marshfield. I was on the volunteer fire department, active in the, in the community, which I think is a good experience for a legislator to have. Uh, my father also ran a business. He had a side business that so we all worked there and we had the, the seasonal business but we had payroll and had the, you know those issues of running a business i also started a trade association a renewable energy trade association in vermont and work with businesses throughout vermont and what it means to be a business in vermont both on the energy things but also just on like you know workers comp and other issues like that so and then i've been a legislature i've been a chair of, com of a committee and i think that also will help me represent the, the districts well and I just really care about it. I want to work. I don't feel like the, the Democrats have a monopoly on good ideas. I'm happy to work with the governor and Republicans. I think if you talk to the Republicans in the Senate, the, they will say that I have somebody that they can work with. I've sponsored bills with some of the most conservative Republicans we have. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next is Mike Deering, and Ann Watson will be going after Mike. So I'm uh, Michael Deering II. Uh, I am a husband and uh, a father of four children. Um, my passion really lies with my children and my family. And to me, this is the single biggest reason why I continue to serve. And was also the single biggest reason why I chose to accept the Republican nomination uh, after a write-in campaign uh, not done on my own volition. Um, I was asked to uh, accept that nomination and proudly did so. Um, because to me, I'm somebody who I see a need and I fill that need as the best way that I can. Um, I've been a community uh, advocate for many, many years. I spent four years with Head Start uh, as their school board director. I also spent uh, five years as a youth football coach between uh, elementary, middle, and high school, uh, advocating for those youth, trying to be a positive male role model in those people's lives. Um, I'm also a current two-term city councilor in Barrie, uh, where we've experienced some devastating floods. Um, so many of the things that we're currently going through in Barrie, we as a group are currently going through within our, our county and our state. Um, so I have a lot of experience currently with the systems that are in place um, and how many of them are not working for all of us. Um, so to me, this is about the passion to lead by example to uh, continue to find that need uh, and to fill that gap. Um, we see that there's a huge affordability crisis. And to me, this legislative session is, session is important because if things don't change, me and my family, I don't see having a future here like many of the people that are currently moving out. So that is why uh, I really like to uh, continue to have support and uh, hope that you can vote for me uh, for State Senate in Washington County District. Thank you, Mike. Um, Ian Watson is next, uh, followed by Mike Doyle. I didn't turn. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out this evening. My name is Ann Watson. I'm also asking for one of the three votes uh, for the. And um, I, uh, I want to let you know that I was uh, once a, um, a mayor of. I was a Check. 
you know, I can just yell. I can just be loud. I'm going to do teacher voice. Yeah. Is that okay? Here comes, here comes, here comes the microphone. I'm stumbling over my words anyway. Speak <laughs> up. Yeah. We've, okay, we've never Thank had you. technical problems before. Check, huh? check. But okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out this evening. My name is Ann Watson. I'm asking for one of your three votes for the Washington Senate District. I am a former mayor of Montpelier. And prior to that, I was uh, on the city council in Montpelier. And I, I had a what I think is a, a good reputation as a mayor in Montpelier. And the reason was because I was uh, deeply committed to listening, to making sure that I heard all opinions, whether they uh, agreed with what I thought or not. And in fact, I actually think that having disagreement as a a part of the democratic process is critical. Uh, it's, it's key to coming out with good policy and good legislation in the end. If we are all agreeing, that uh, ends up working sometimes against our own purposes. So uh, I'm a mom, I'm a teacher, I teach high school science and math at Montpelier High School. Um, my degree is in physics and I'm a, a union member. Uh, so I, uh, th those roles served me really well in the, the legislature last year. I was a um, vice chair of the Natural Resources and Energy Committee and I was also on the Government Operations Committee. And I'm running because every day I work with high school kids who are worried about their future. Uh, it's important to me that we are building a sustainable future for everyone in Vermont, and that means uh, sustainably socially, environmentally, and financially. Uh, one of the things I'm sure we'll talk about this evening is uh, the financial crisis that we are in this evening, or that we're in generally, and I have a lot of thoughts about what we can do about uh, reducing taxes and making uh, Vermont more um, uh, financially friendly to working in middle class Vermonters. Working middle class Vermonters are pretty tapped out right now, and we need to um, address that. So that's one of my top priorities going into this next legislative session. Uh, and I guess I will leave it right there. Thank you. Come in and Hello. My name is Mike Doyle. I am a native Montpelierite. I am almost old enough to run for president. <laughs> I graduated from the University of Vermont, became a Peace Corps volunteer, had a commission in the Army Reserve. I worked in my career as an industrial hygienist, a safety engineer, and a hazardous waste uh, expert. My Master of Science degree is in environmental management from the University of San Francisco. I returned to Vermont upon the death of my mother and inherited a turnkey operation, the Doyle Guest House in Montpelier, Vermont, which I run until this day. Anecdotal evidence is seldom authoritative, but it is often instructive. I went down to Roxbury to see what happened to their school, talked with the general store manager a good long time. It seems that Roxbury had 35 students and 31 employees. If you think about that for a minute, we'll get to what I think the core problem in Vermont is. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope you vote for me. Thank you, Mike. So before we get uh, started on the questions, I'll mention the two questions from the league are written to be neutral questions. And when we have questions from audience members and from community members, uh, sometimes they take the slant 
uh, that that person has. So they may not um, come from the same perspective that candidates do or that other people in the audience do. And the same thing with information that's provided by in questions or by candidates. Some of that will not be the same for everybody. So we're, I'm not editing what people ask. I'm going to ask questions as they've been written. Um, but the first right question is from a League of Women Voters. The candidates received this question in advance. And on this one, we're actually going to go in the reverse order from the order we just went in. So Mike Doyle will be first, followed by Ann Watson. But the question is, how will Vermont fund quality education for all students given rising costs, needed capital improvements, and the decrease in student population? Mike? Funding for public school has traditionally and always been based on property tax. There is a reason for that. It is true that most of the states have adopted a formula where part of the tax derives from income while part of the tax derives from property. Bear this in mind. What works in Rhode Island does not necessarily work in Alaska. The problem with funding public school on income tax is that incomes in areas can shift dramatically up and down and often in unpredictable ways. What we need to do, and believe me, I believe that teachers do deserve a good salary and good benefits and they deserve what a good union member ought to have. But when we send our tax paying people to negotiate with a national teachers union, let's send someone other than Neville Chamberlain. There is about a 400 million dollar difference in what we can be paying and what we should be paying. We can save a lot of money if we start economizing without necessarily hurting the employees of the school district. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Ian Watson is next to be followed by Mike Deering. Thank you. So I agree that we are in a place that is unsustainable from a, a financial perspective for our, our education funding right now. So uh, I would be very interested in moving um, our funding to an income-based system, uh, but that feels to me like a really uh, big change. Um, and so one of the things I think we can uh, realistically uh, tackle this session is taxing second homes at a much higher rate. So that would mean breaking out the non-homestead tax into its component parts. Uh, and th this is something, uh, this is data that the state has not had before, but um, because of bills that were passed this last session, we should, the state should have that data uh, moving into, um, into the next session. Um, the second thing I, I think we need to do is petition Medicaid uh, and the federal government to have mental health be uh, that the schools are providing be paid for through Medicaid. Uh, this is something that uh, a lot of schools added on during uh, COVID um, from ESSER money. Uh, these are these services were. Uh, very helpful to students, and uh, a lot of school districts see these services as, as essential, and I agree. Um, but it's, uh, it's really difficult when we are trying to pay for them um, from the tax uh, base. And uh, if we can get support for, for that from the federal government, that would be helpful. A third thing is uh, in terms of uh, health care. Uh, it's, it's hard to keep our uh, school spending down when health care is uh, increasing by you know, double-digit percentages. Uh, so thinking about 
um, what we can do there. The, the state auditor had a, a, a report on reference-based pricing that I think could help us across the board uh, with keeping our, our costs down in terms of healthcare. And then uh, in terms of closing schools, uh, I think we need to c consider what is best for kids. Thanks. Thank you, Ann. Mike Deering is next to be followed by Andrew. School costs, can you hear me? S school costs, uh, really a lot of it has to do with the overhead. That we have uh, administration upon administration. That we have a business manager, <clears throat> an assistant business manager. We have benefits managers, assistant benefits managers, an assistant to the assistant. So when you have all of those positions constantly through different districts, you're constantly reiterating the same thing. You're constantly spending money on the same thing. So you need a more regionalized approach to some of those things as well. Then you can also shave some of those costs. Also to have a re more regionalized approach with things like healthcare, to have a more larger group in numbers when it comes to insurances, that's how insurances work. So if we can get more people onto the plan, then we could potentially also save money when it comes to that plan. Um, we may also need to continue to consolidate smaller schools where costs can be trimmed. Um, again, duplicating services uh, needed to be, need to be eliminated, that those costs are just too much. Um, we see that our school infrastructure needs are constantly um, being talked about, but they're never really identified. So we need to identify those construction needs or those infrastructure needs as well so that we can really have those conversations about what's important and prioritizing those. And also, again, another regionalized approach to helping with construction with those. So maybe it's the state comes in and works with those so that we have it regionalized so you get things cheaper. As far as the labor, uh, you're getting more labor, so you're not having to pay um, for not having the labor. You're getting to bring in materials at a cheaper rate because you're being able to buy in bulk instead of just one job. So if you can do multiple schools uh, instead of just one school, you get a better cost benefit as well. Thank you, Mike. Andrew? Followed by Ann Cummings. Yeah, let's see if I can get the green light to go on. I'm going to get a yellow light. Is there a microphone? Hey, yeah. good yeah. idea. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, I thought the question was a great question, and that's really the issue, that we have rising costs in our school system with, with declining student population. I was on the Education Committee my first two terms when we issued the study to look at what the overall infrastructure costs are with all our schools. And we thought, wow, this is going to be a big number. It's going to be like $400 million. It came out to be like a billion. And then we added the PCB costs onto that. So there's a lot of talk about the income tax, switching things to in income tax. I think if we can do some of that, I'm okay with that. I was on a commission that we looked at it. It was more complicated than we thought it was going to be. It's hard to do without hurting renters. Uh, but if there's there are ways to expand our income sensitivity program that we already have, that's, that's equitable. I'm supportive of that. But in the end, it's about the spending. You can move the taxes around. We could add taxes. But if, this, if we have a spending problem, then that isn't going to solve that. So I think we do need to look at well, how much we're spending per student. And we have to keep in mind, as Senator Watson said, what's best for the children. We all want our children to thrive and have good educations, obviously. And I think we just need to work on what's the best way to do that. How can we do that with regional high schools and other things like that? The other thing I think that's important is that we have a disconnect. Our, our education formula is too complicated. And there isn't a connection to when you vote to what your taxes are. You could vote for a school budget that goes down, but your taxes could still go up because of the statewide education funding. So I think one thing that will help on that, which is not my idea, other people have came up with this, where you separate the things in the school budget that's under local control, like just the salaries and the number of faculty or uh, staff you might have, and take away the things that the state is mandating, like the, the state, the insurance cost is a state settled thing, uh, the universal meals, other things that, that, that the state is requiring to have that separate. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Ann Cummings to be followed by Donald. Yes, thank you. Um, I chair the tax committee. I am presently 
on the Commission on the Future of Public Education. I'm on its steering committee and I'm on its finance committee. I'm meeting at least once a week working on this issue. It's not that we haven't worked on this issue before. We work on it every year. We did Act 60 in response to the Brigham decision, uh, which said that a penny on the tax rate in every town has to raise the same amount of money for that town. And that's where it all goes in and it gets equalized and it comes out. That's what causes the confusion as to the impact on your tax rate. But we do the December 1st letter, which says to school boards and to voters, if you vote what it looks like your school boards are going to be asking for, this is what is going to happen to your taxes. This year, the December 1st letter said, your schools, if you vote, your taxes are going up 18%. By the time we got finished with second, third, and even fourth votes, your taxes on average went up 15 to 17%. All the state sales tax revenue, which is somewhat income tax, income based, goes to education. All the lottery goes to education, part of the rooms and meals. We take that out and we have to raise the rest on property. But we don't make the decision as to how much we raise. We the people, all of us do that. I think to get a handle on this, we're going to have a multi-approach, you know, multi-pronged approach. I think we're going to have to look at consolidation. I think we're going to have to, uh, two-thirds of our people now do vote based on their income. You are limited to a percentage of your income. So it's going to be a multi-phased um, discussion and it's going to be a discussion between the legislature and the people. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, Donald? There are two parts to this question. How much does it cost, and how do we pay for it? First, we need to address our spending. Our spending is the aggregate total of all the school budgets around the state. Senator Cummings mentioned we're constrained by the Brigham decision, which mandates that all students statewide are treated essentially equal. What one school district does affects the rest. We need to find a way to lower the cost. We have a top-heavy, bloated administrative cost. Too many school districts with too many staff per student. We should consider restructuring our school districts roughly along county lines. We have 14 counties, should maybe have 14 school districts. Uh, some of the smaller counties may be combined to form a school district. Chittenden County, perhaps, uh, could be multiple districts. And have uh, representative school district boards to maintain that local control that we cherish. We also need to set a minimum class size. Uh, the idea that students in Roxbury have to travel 45 minutes to go to school in Montpelier, I think is ridiculous. So consolidating on long county lines, I think makes more sense. Second, we need to address where the money comes from. I think we all agree that the current property tax funded system is not working. 49 states fund their schools differently we're alone in how we do things. We need to look at what the other states are doing and consider if we can use parts of those systems to improve our own. I believe we need to move towards a system where schools are primarily funded by income taxes so that more people are paying based on their ability rather than fewer based on the values of their homes. Special circumstances such as special, special education, special needs, etc., should be fully funded by the state apart from the school budget. And then additional programs a particular district desires to fund might still be provided for by a local options property tax. But the general idea is a baseline funding per pupil, which follows the student lowering the burden on everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. I'm going to hold off a minute on the second question for League of Women Voters and do a a follow-up education question from a community member. Uh, this is from a, 
a resident in Worcester, which is a small school, which was, uh, which has been discussed as far as possibly closing. Uh, this question has multiple parts. I'm going to deal with just the first part. So there's a lot of discussion of the closure of small schools, despite evidence that such closures don't save any money. The reports required by Act 46, which pushed for consolidation and small school closures, have not been done, so there is no evidence that consolidation has saved money. So the question here is, what is your position on the closing of small schools? And what, in what circumstances should that be done, and should more work be done first? And so Mike Deering will get to go first, then Donald will go after him. Closing small schools is, is never really uh, the best option, honestly. Um, we all know that, that the more one-on-one -on -one individual education you can get, it's more beneficial. But we also know that the cost of that is astronomical. So there has to be a, a healthy mix somewhere in between. And from what I'm understanding is that we haven't closed the small schools to really understand what that would do. And we really haven't looked at it to understand what that would do. I do know that the larger the class size, the more difficult it is. And I say this because I'm in a classroom most days. I'm a substitute um, transportation sub coordinator at Barry City School. Um, that the larger the classroom, the more difficult it is to teach. The more difficult it is also for the students to grasp on to what's going on. Um, but there has to be a healthy median in between. Um, I feel like Act 46, coming from the Bear Unified Union School District, um, was a forced marriage. That we never really saw the, uh, the cost-saving measures because we really didn't combine much. That we kept three different schools, we didn't really combine a whole lot, and we saw that throughout the state. We also saw that because of that forced marriage, there was a lot of money that was left on the table between communities um, that didn't accept that. Um, so this has, we have a lot to learn, um, and, and I don't have all the answers, but I'm absolutely willing to listen twice as much as I speak, uh, and I'm always willing to bring new ideas to the table, um, and that's something that I bring um, as somebody who's not an incumbent, somebody who's not been working at this in the State House for the last uh, two or 20 years. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Donald, to be followed by Ann Watson. I think I largely agree with what Mike just said. Uh, closing schools isn't the ideal, um, but I think we need to look at them as in take each case individually. Uh, the case of Roxbury, for example, 30 students, 31 staff, uh, that doesn't seem to work. Uh, I don't know if there was another way to reconfigure things. Uh, as he said, I, and I agree, I don't have all the answers but I'm willing to listen. Um, and I'm a, I'm a truck driver by trade and business owner. Uh, I haven't been around the, uh, the school funding discussions much until recent, uh, so I don't have those answers. Um, but again, I'll, I'll learn about the issues and listen to the, the experts and the voters. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Ann Watson to be followed by Ann Cummings. Thank you. So I am a teacher and uh, I can speak from experience that too uh, many students in a classroom is difficult, but also too few is, is also difficult. And so I, uh, I hear the argument about uh, having a, uh, a reasonable class size. I think that is an okay thing to expect from our schools. Um, but I am not uh, interested at this point in recreating Act 46, which forced um, some, uh, well, uh, cre created some um, significant incentives for school districts and for some school districts to merge. Um, I think that uh, was very painful for a lot of school districts, and I think we need to learn from that and uh, not 
put people in the same position again. I know a lot of these conversations are, are happening at the local level right now, and I think it's healthy to have that conversation at the local level. Um, one thing I think is worth mentioning is that in this last session we had uh, a bill creating uh, BOCES, which if folks are not familiar with, are uh, structures for school districts to participate in together so that they can have um, uh, they can purchase things together, they can share some administrative costs, so it should uh, help people save money. Because one of the drivers for why it didn't save as much money as everybody expected was because when you merge districts, then busing and traveling uh, costs often increase. But if you can help people just save uh, money on uh, the administrative side of things, then, then that can be, uh, I think, genuinely helpful. Um, so. I also want to recognize that closing a school can sometimes for uh, communities mean a, a loss of identity for the community. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think uh, it's best at this point to have that conversation at the local level. Thank you, Ann. Ann Cummings to be followed by Mike Doyle. Okay. I can tell you what I know so far and what I think will be part of the solution. The $400 million that Mike Doyle mentioned is from the PICUS report. It was released this week. And basically, the PICUS Odom com Company is a uh, nationally known um, experts in what is adequacy. Every other state, the state supplies and what is determined to be an adequate amount of money to provide a good education. The local voters don't get to say what they think is an adequate amount. Because our class sizes, in general, are so much smaller than any other state's average class sizes, his system has to come with all these caveats. If you had the national size, there are recommended class sizes for high schools, for elementary schools, there are recommended school sizes, classes where it's been demonstrated that you know, the children learn the best, classes that are the size, uh, schools that are the size where we can afford to provide the variety of education and educational topics that kids need nowadays. Um, we fall way below those. And, we, and it, it, it is expensive. It is also very painful to change it. And doing it one school or one district at a time won't save money. Um, I've got a bill sitting on my desk for $328 million to fix the urgent health and safety needs in our schools. I don't know where we're getting $328 million. We need to have a very open public conversation and find a way to change our structure so that we can educate our kids well. Thank you, Ann. Mike Doyle to be followed by Andrew Perchley. I'm fairly familiar with the State House. I grew up in Montpelier, and it's only two blocks from where I live. Once upon a time, I was talking with the legislature, and he said that one of the things he liked best about his job was how it gave him an opportunity to tweak the laws, and like a mechanic working on spark plugs or something, he loved to tweak the laws. My fellow Vermonters, I submit to you on this occasion that you are all victims of over-tweaking. Mm -hmm. If I could wave a magic wand, I would vote for smaller schools. And the younger the children, the closer those schools would be to their parents. Public schooling depends largely on what you mean when you say public schooling. 
it is not necessarily a uniform monolith where all students are learning all the same things from the same curricula. Public schooling is funding education equally for all of our children. And some of these, under that formula, would be learning Hebrew, and some of these would be going to magnet schools, and some of these would be going to parochial schools, and the resources for all of this would be coming from hubs, large schools that are publicly funded. My vision. Thank you, Mike. Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, when I first got elected, it was kind of on the heels of Act 46, and there's a lot of discussion in the Education Committee and in community meetings about what, 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 what was the impact of that? Was it saving money? What is the impact of, of closing these small schools or closing some of them, you know, aren't even that small? And I really had a compassion for those that were fighting to keep their schools open, and I, and I agreed and still do agree with their criticisms of Act 46 as far as a way to save money. Because uh, these schools are the heart of their communities, and I remember one parent telling me that, that well, they, their parent, their kids had already left the school, but they said the school was more than the identity or the heart of the community, but it w gave the community hope just to have children like in the community center. It was, they just couldn't imagine not having that and having the, the community basically survive. So I have a lot of uh, compassion for that situation. But it's a struggle between local control and state funding. And how do we balance those two things? And I, so I think the decision does have to be at a local level, but the state has to have some budget controls. It's like, okay, if you really want to keep this local school, you can do so. But here's, the state is only going to provide so much funding to do it. And some local schools will survive and be small because of the way the community is set up. Others might not, not be able to do that because when you ask the local voters to pay for it, they might decide, okay, we really like our local school, but if we have to pay for it, not the whole state through the education funding, maybe it's a different discussion. And I think that is uh, where the discussion should happen. And I think we should start at the high schools. I agree with what Mr. Doyle said about the, the younger the kids, the closer to the, to the parents. So like in my district, Twinfield, Danville, and Cabot, as high schools, could all combine, I think, success successfully, given the demographic issues we're facing of less and less students. Thank you, Andrew. The next question, uh, Ann Watson will go first, then Andrew will go second. And this question is from the League of Women Voters. How will the state of Vermont fund infrastructure needs to mitigate and respond to climate events. And also one of the questions from the audience here is connected to that. What flood mitigation strategies do you support? So Ann Watson, you're first. Thank you. Uh, so one of the things that I, I'm really proud of from the last session was that I, I worked on a bill to uh, make the world's biggest oil companies pay for the damage that they are causing to Vermonters. So uh, it's called the Climate Superfund Bill, and the idea is that uh, it's, it's modeled after other uh, Superfund type uh, legislation where if you dump uh, some kind of pollutant into an area and cause damage to a community, whether or not you knew it was going to uh, cause that damage, the company who did that is responsible for, for paying for the, the mitigation uh, of that damage. Uh, and so we know that the, the world's largest oil companies uh, knew that they were uh, polluting uh, the, the air with excess carbon and knew that that would cause damage. And so it's... Um, but beyond them knowing that, uh, the fact that it caused damage uh, means that they need to be held responsible for that. And so uh, that bill is now law. It was allowed to go into uh, effect uh, without the governor's signature, but he did not uh, otherwise veto it, which is awesome. And uh, so we expect to see a check from that if everything goes as fast as possible um, by 2026. So... Uh, that is not soon, um, so in the meanwhile, um, I think we need to be considering other uh, potential sources of revenue, and a lot of this, I think, needs to be um, assistance to municipalities as they're having to build and rebuild roads um, and to um, individual businesses and, and considering buyouts 
uh, so that we can reduce the amount of um, continuing damage that we're likely to see from flooding. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways that we can talk about uh, raising revenue to cover those costs, you know, thinking about, uh, again, not tapping out um, everyday Vermonters, but, you know, can we increase the uh, meals and rooms and alcohol uh, percentage tax, things that um, uh, folks from out of town who enjoy our, our facilities are um, using that we can um, get some money from. Thank you, Ann. Andrew, to be followed by Donald. Yeah, flood mitigation, unfortunately, has been a big topic the last two years. Last year, I spent a lot of time with Montpelier and, and Barry folks. Uh, this year, a lot of folks in, in Plainfield that I live outside of the village of and in Middlesex, and just seeing the, the destruction and having these small towns say there's no way we, like, so Plainfield's saying we're just not going to maybe build that road back because they're like, even at, if we have to pay for 10% of it, it's, you know, four times our annual budget. And what would that do to the property taxes that are already going up for other reasons? So it's, it's definitely uh, insult upon injury with our other uh, affordability issues that we have and, and rising costs. Um, I think overall, though, we do need to move people out of the flood corridor, or the river corridor, not even the floodplain, but the entire corridor, because that, these rivers are going to keep moving when we have these 10, 15, 18, 20 inches of rain over a weekend or a night. These small brooks will turn into raging rivers and will rip out land and houses and roads within the whole corridor area. But that's a huge task to move everybody out of the flood corridor. So how are we going to do that? Uh, and how do we do that where we also keep the towns whole? Like I, I'm sympathetic to the towns that say when people apply to get their house as a hazardous mitigation bought out, that's loss of grand list for that town and tax revenue and people in the town. So it is, it's a very tough situation. On the transportation side of things, because a lot of this damage is to our transportation infrastructure, roads, railroads, bridges, uh, we do need to look at a different way of funding that because we're already not re receiving enough transportation funds just to maintain what we have, let alone the floods. So uh, we need to look at our gas tax. We need to look at our weight limits. We need to reevaluate that, and we can talk more about it, but it, it's, it, we need more revenue for our existing infrastructure. And I did vote for the EV fees. I support electric vehicles, but I also supported a fee on those. It was the one fee that the governor didn't uh, veto. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Donald's next, to be followed by Mike Doyle. First of all, our legislators need to remember that they're spending the people's money. The state holds people's money in trust. And they've been squandering our money. Uh, we need to spend money where it's needed. And where it is needed is flood mitigation, uh, resiliency, not on fantasy of saving the world, saving the, uh, changing the climate, stopping climate change. If we do have to raise taxes, that's where the money should go, is flood resilience. Andrew just mentioned weight limits. Those are set by the federal government, not the state. There's not much we can do about lowering our weight limits. Um, flood mitigation, what, what policies I might support? Uh, dredging. Riverbank stabilization, um, rechanneling the, the stream beds, uh, especially on on corners to direct the uh, the main current away from the curve, uh, where it might destroy the bank. Um, we need to upgrade our our culverts. What we also need to do is look at ways we can reduce stormwater runoff. Um, as we develop more and more developments, we're creating more impervious surfaces that create runoff. Then we build solar panels and stuff in our farm fields, which create additional runoff. 
Why aren't we building these solar panels on the rooftops on Main Street? Why aren't we building solar panels in the parking lots, already built surfaces? Thank you, Donald. Mike Doyle to be followed by Mike Deering. Well, one of the very first things we could do in terms of flood mitigation, remembering that Vermont has been dealing with floods ever since its founding, is to be prepared for the next flood by ensuring that our emergency response systems are well stocked and have what we will need to do the search, rescue, and remediation that can be done the day after the flood has receded. We can do that, and we really should. There are a number of different sorts of floods in Vermont. We're not like people living along the Mississippi. We have a greater variety of floods. We have floods caused by ice jams. We have floods caused by flash flooding. You, you can be on top of a hill and still suffer flood damage. We have floods that come from the fact that most of us live in a clay bowl, and when the, the soil gets saturated, the flood comes right through. All of these are civil engineering problems infrastructure money that the federal government provides 90% or 80% of would be the source for uh, removing dams, putting dams where they belong, creating floodplains, uh, and doing all of the things that uh, Donald has just mentioned that we ought to be doing one at a time in preparation for the next flood. Oh, remember, the real existentialistic climate danger Vermonters face is freezing to death. Thank you, Mike. Mike Deering to be followed by Ann Cummings. Thank you, sir. Uh, so as a Barrie City Councilor the last three and a half years, um, many of you know that Barrie has been inundated, inundated with flooding um, beyond imagine. Um, so that's the task um, that we've been working on in the city of Barrie, is how do we rebuild better, but also rebuild away from the river, that we've spent the last 100, 150 years building around our rivers. And now we need to build away from the rivers. So that's tough because if we take a FEMA buyout, then that property goes off the tax rolls completely. So then the community is completely out of that funding. So we need to look at better ways in order to build back. So if we can build back in areas that are, that are flood mitigated, so we build them up higher, we build them away from the river, but we also work on some denser housing as well that we get some of these housings back online so we can help with the grand list. Um, so what happens upstream and what happens downstream affects everyone. We need a more regionalized um, stormwater approach. We need a more regionalized uh, watershed management. That's really the key, is a regionalized watershed approach. Because what we do in Barrie affects people down in Montpelier, it affects people in Williamstown, it affects people everywhere. So the decisions that we're making on city council affect everyone. So as a group, we need to make those decisions. We also need to, uh, we said we need to give the river space that, the, that they deserve. Um, we also need to utilize federal grants, um, pull down those federal dollars, so then our communities can also utilize those um, to help rebuild. Because we know communities like Barry, who faced a million dollar deficit with our budget last year, um, we don't have the money to rebuild like that. But when we're able to pull down federal dollars, whether it's EPA change grant uh, or FEMA funding, um, those are things that will help us rebuild better. Thank you, Mike. Ian. Okay, thank you. Um, I was the mayor in Montpelier during the 92 flood. 
we had as much water in downtown, but it was a piece of cake compared to what happened two years ago because that water backed up gently. The floods we're seeing, Irene and now these last two back to back, have been at a level we've never imagined. I grew up near the ocean. I understand the power of water. I don't think inland that we really appreciate when those streams get moving, they take everything in front of them with it. And we have built along those streams in those valleys because that's the easiest place to build. So we are going to have to, this is a new problem. And because we've had back-to-back -back floods, we really haven't had time to sit down and do any real flood mitigation. It's going to be multi-pronged. We're going to have to find a way to change our building codes. We're going to have to find a way to move housing and to raise housing, and we're gonna to have to find the money to do it. Uh, Florida, they have flood walls that come up. Could we do that? The dams we put in after 27 did their job. No matter how bad this was, it would have been worse if the Wrightsville Dam or the Waterbury Dam had not been there. We need to look at those. We need to look at the floodways. All the maps that FEMA has don't work anymore because these 100-year floods are now happening every two years, and those maps are being redone. So we're just starting this, and we're going to have to, again, develop strategies, uh, work at areas where we perhaps pay farmers to have areas that... Uh, you know, can, the floods can be mitigated and can go over. So I'm at stop. Thank you, Ann. The next question is about the clean heat standard. And uh, Andrew will be going first, and Mike Doyle will be going second. Here's the question. Uh, now that the consulting firm hired by the legislature has made it clear that the clean heat standard will cost Vermonters $9.6 billion over 24 years, will you vote yes to let it go into effect or will you vote no to kill it? Andrew? Yeah, thank you. I think the, the question is, is a good example of some of the misinformation that we're having around this discussion. The, the potential study did have a large number, but it wasn't the cost that Vermonters are going to face. That's not what the potential report says. I've read the report, looked at the PowerPoint presentation, and the, the potential study was like, what would it cost if we met the whole Global Warming Solutions Act goals over this time frame, and we paid 100% of the cost to meet those goals? Because that's what we asked them to do. Like, what would that be? That is not the same as saying that is what this thing would cost Vermonters, because that thing is just a study. What we at the legislature will do is like, okay, what are our goals? We want to make heat more affordable. We want to lower our dependence on, on fossil fuels. What's the best way to do that? We don't want to do it if it's going to raise fuel prices that make it unaffordable. That's nobody's goal. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, so you can't even say whether you'll vote for it or vote against it because there is no it. There's no proposal. There's no, there, all we have is this potential study and like, some ideas of how it would be set up. And we'll know in January, and then when we get to January, that's when we'll get all the information, and the committees will say, okay, what could we do? Here's, here's what the PUC and the department said. The PUC also said, hey, you might want to just do a tax. We could look at that. We could say, is that better? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So there isn't going to be a vote in January for or against the clean heat standard. The thing in January is going to be, okay, given what we learned, given what we want to do, what should we do? And I think that's a great conversation to have. So I really support that conversation, and I will vote based on what the proposal is when it's completed. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Mike Doyle to be followed by Ian Cummings. There's a Clean Heat Act. The Clean Heat Act. Uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, we're not going to do it because we can't afford it. 
One of the biggest problems that America and Americans are facing today is inflation. Inflation robs everybody. Well, what can an elected official do about inflation? The one thing that we can do is attempt to increase the supply of the goods and services that people use. How do you do that sitting at a desk? The one thing you can do is you can move to lower the price of fuel. If you lower the price of fuel, you are going to lower the price of everything else, which will make more money available to more people, and that will solve an awful lot of the problems which we have been discussing tonight. So would I vote against the clean heat standard if I could? I understand that it's probably not even going to come up for a vote. I would vote against the clean heat standard. Thank you, Mike. Ann Cummings to be followed by Ann Watson. Okay. It's interesting we just were discussing flooding because at this day and age, I don't think anyone denies looking at what just happened in the Carolinas and <clears throat> Florida that climate change is getting to be very expensive. That it, the destruction we saw was nothing compared to the destruction they saw, saw in western, I think it's North Carolina. That's a problem. And so the problem we're trying to solve is how do we reduce our carbon emissions? How do we, uh, you know, stop this flooding or prevent it from getting worse? I was very vocal when the clean heat standard was out about my concern about the cost. I think none of us really objects, as I don't, to going to a renewable energy source that's clean. The problem is getting over the hump. Heat pumps cost money. Um, you know, weatherizing your house costs money. It costs a significant amount of money. Um, Half of our population, half of our families are headed by someone who is 55 years old or older. That means you're either headed to retirement or you're already on a fixed income. And you're probably not going to live long enough to see <clears throat> a return on your investment. So we as a society need to find a way to help people make that transition. That's what's going to be key. Can we find a way to do that? I was one of the senators who was um, active in having that bill referred to the PUC to have actual numbers put on it. It's coming back. Now we'll adjust it, and we'll see what we can come up with. Thank you, Ian. Ian Watson to be followed by Donald. Thank you. Uh, so I want to uh, agree with uh, what Senator Perchlik was saying uh, earlier that I think there has been a lot of uh, misinformation out there about uh, the clean heat standard and uh, appreciate that. Uh, I just want to reiterate uh, what he was saying because I, I don't think you can say it enough that that um, $9.6 billion is what the state would be paying if the state subsidized 100% of all the um, installations. And we would never, I don't think we would ever design a program to do exactly that. So this was kind of what is the upper end. Um, and I, I think it's, um, important to keep in mind that right now uh, we are just at the mercy of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, the fluctuations in the price has been wild over the last decade and uh, uh, not to mention you know that we were you know, who knows what's going to happen with the price of oil that's entirely outside of our control uh, due to what's happening in the Middle East. 
Um, one of the things that's really convenient about renewable energy is that it is also cheaper. If, um, if you look at the graphs of uh, per BTU, how much uh, energy costs by fuel source, uh, renewable sources tend to be uh, much cheaper than uh, the fossil fuel alternatives. And so I appreciate what Senator Cummings was saying about like we have to help people get over the, the hump of getting to that cheaper fuel. And so that is what the aim of this, um, of the clean heat standard is. Now, uh, I, think it, I think it is fair to say that uh, you know, we, we ne we're going to need to look at what the final numbers are uh, uh, once the rules come out. Uh, so those, those final numbers are not going to be done uh, until December or January. And so and I think we'll, we'll need to take a look at that at that time. And I want to, uh, I'll just say, I'm feeling very open-handed about what the best solution is. Maybe it's a tax, maybe it's a clean heat standard. Uh, but we'll see what makes the most sense and uh, ultimately uh, who would have to pay for it. So thanks. Thank you, Ian. Donald, to be followed by Mike Deering. The clean heat standard is not just a study, despite what you're being told. The Global Warming Solutions Act was the predecessor bill that led to this. It's the bill that keeps on giving. Following that, they created the clean heat standard. That standard says they shall do these things by a certain date. The vote coming up in January is, shall we pull the trigger and implement, implement this standard and set this uh, um, trading system up for uh, trading credits and stuff like that? The NV5 report that came out about a month ago, uh, the final report is the bill that the legislature commissioned to be done, uh, the, the study that the legislature commissioned that would tell us what this was cost. It's convenient that they're saying that the results won't be known until December or January, that's after the election. They won't tell you until then. I'm telling you right now, I will vote no and kill this disaster of a bill. Thank you, Donald. Mike Deering. So all I've heard uh, in last night's forum and tonight's forum is misinformation with a $9.6 billion price tag. Uh, and who's going to pay for it? You know, who's going to get the people over the hump to pay for that? Um, and quite honestly, if things continue to go the way that they have the last two years, we're all gonna pay for it, all $9.6 billion of that. Now, to have the potential to add a dollar to $4 to their heating fuel, or if you can't afford it, well, go get a blanket, doesn't fly with me. That in Washington County District, we can't afford that. In the city of Barrie, where I currently live and I represent as a city councilor, we can't afford that. We are one of the poorest communities in the state. We are one of the poorest counties in the state. This is not Chittenden County. We can't afford that. So I will not be voting for the clean heat standard. I will make sure that I kill this bill because we cannot afford this. Thank you, Mike. We're gonna to get to one more question and then closing arguments. There are a lot of questions that people have turned in that we're not going to be able to get to. There are follow-up questions relating to heat pumps, other questions relating to uh, should Vermont Yankee be recommissioned. There are other follow-up questions relating to education. And uh, the last one I'm going to do here is going to be about the housing shortage. Reminder for everyone that the candidates, uh, I believe they all have websites. You can go to their websites to get more information about their views on things. And also, normally, you can contact them through their websites if you want to share your views or ask them questions. So the last question. Now, this time around, we're going to start with Ann Cummings, and we're going to go left to right all the way down the table. So Ann will be first, and then Mike Deering. And the question here, combining two. One of the questions from the, our audience is, how will you address our housing shortage? And a longer version of that is, 
Vermont has a broad housing shortage that affects those who want to buy a home, those who rent, and those who want to move here. The Vermont Housing Finance Agency recently reported that the state will need between 24,000 and 36,000 new housing units in the next five years, required, requiring construction far beyond the current rate. What should the legislature do about this? So Ann Cummings is first. Okay. In the morning, I am on the Housing and Economic Development Committee. So I've been at the heart of most of the major issues we've talked about. What we have done and what we're in the process of doing is redoing um, Act 250. There are a lot of interim rules in place. Basically, you don't need to get Act 250 permits uh, if you're building in a designated downtown, a village center, or a mile around it. Um, that's interim while we're redoing the local maps so that there will be areas where you can build without permit. Um, there will be areas where you will need other permits, and there will be scenic areas, environmentally sensitive areas where you can't build. Our base problem, and I'm a retired realtor, is we've put those incentives there, but the private sector, we have built, put $800 million of federal money into building subsidized housing, and we will continue to put it in, but we need, you know, something like $20 million a year to um, and we don't have that um, to catch up. But the private sector is not responding. The demand is there, but the, the builders aren't building. I've been told we lost a lot of builders in the housing slump. Um, the other problem is you cannot build with today's material and labor costs. You cannot build a house that the average working person can afford to build. Average working person can do 250. It's over 300 to build it. So we've we've got a base crisis there, um, and we need to start working with the building industry to find out how we can do it. There's a couple of things they're doing nationally that we could talk about. Thank you, Ann. Mike Deering. Addressing the housing shortage really is about supply and demand. It's about that price equilibrium as well, that we have the demand, we don't have the supply, so what do we do? So what can government do? So well, we can create policies. Now a policy that could be really helpful is something that I started to talk a little bit about last night is a five-year freeze. Now essentially what that talks about is that you have a property, say it's at $100,000. You pay that $100,000, you build on that property, and maybe you build it to a million dollar property. Now, over the course of five years, you go up 20% in your property taxes being paid. What that does is it allows the upfront costs because costs are about 200 or more dollars a square foot. It lowers the cost to build. It brings that, that money into uh, the developer so they can continue to build, but it also brings homes online. It brings people into those homes. It brings people into jobs. It boosts our economy. So those things continue to roll. So if we can kind of, I don't want to say shortchange ourselves, but we're investing in our future. So it might take five years for us to get the full property value um, going into the economy in the city and or into this, um, the city or the town and also the education fund, but it's five years. We'll get that money. It's money that's not currently in the system, and if we're not doing things to help people build, to lower the cost, then we're not gonna see it. Um, and really, it's about the price equilibrium, that there's supply and demand, and there's not the supply that's gonna meet the demand unless we build. Thank you, Mike. Mike Doyle. Well, <clears throat> There comes a point when you finally realize that you can't afford something. And when you reach that point, 
you have to make a decision about using what you do have. In Vermont, following COVID, and maybe a number of other things, we have a lot of heated plumbing, electricity. We've got a lot of empty space. We've got empty colleges that uh, don't have students. We have empty office buildings that can't get workers back. We have a lot of empty space. Now, uh, I opened this conversation with a, uh, a story about what happened in Roxbury. Why did Roxbury have 31 employees for 35 students? That wasn't because the people of Roxbury made that decision. That was because regulations told them they had to have 31 employees. Regulations have kept the developers out of Vermont because it's too hard and too unpredictable and too easy to lose money building in Vermont. Now, I know of a certain real estate, uh, uh, a developer in New York that made an awful lot of money uh, developing real estate. Why don't we just get out of their way and allow entrepreneurial forces to use all of this empty space we have and let them see if they can make some money in Vermont. That, I think, would improve a lot of our problems. Thank you, Mike. Donald. We have people who want to buy a home. We have builders who are ready to build the homes, but we don't have the land to build them on because the permitting process is too difficult. It costs too much to get the permits. It takes too long to get the permits. There's too many permits that have to be obtained in a certain order. We need to streamline that process. We need to reform Act 250 to ease the red tape. They created the, the carve-out in urban areas that would exempt builders from Act 250 in the downtown areas. As Ann Cummings said in a Hardwick Gazette interview, to build where they want you to build. But what about the people that don't want to build in the downtown? What if you want to build in the country? That doesn't solve that problem. What they did do is expand the Act 250 system by create, replacing the uh, Act 250 review board with a full-time professional board, five more members, four full-time bureaucrats from the government here to help. All the circumvent public notice and due process uh, are, uh, open meeting laws because they were having too many problems serving notice. Now they just do this all the time. That's what they do. That's not Act 250 reform. So we need to reform Act 250 Minimize the delays that take years, because when those delays happen, the building gets delayed, and then inflation kicks in, and it costs more to build than was projected. And my time is up. Thank you, Donald. Andrew. I think it's important to remember that number that Senator Cummings, I think, started out with, that 25,000 homes. Uh, I'm, if we're really going to do that, and I think the housing problem is the number one problem we have, because it cascades into a lot of these other problems. So we have to try to get to that kind of number of homes. So I'm, if we can do more Act 250 reform, I'm fine with that. It's not going to build 25,000 homes. Because the other, the main problem is, even if you let people build them anywhere, the, the price that it costs to build is more than the people can afford. So even if we had no permitting, it wouldn't fix the problem. It might help on, on the edges. So we need to increase funding to VHCB, increase funding to the VHFA, the housing finance agency. BHIP is a great program. This is a, a, an a example where I agree with the governor. we we'll put more money into BHIP, which fixes existing structures. So we have structures that are there that are just units offline. There's empty buildings. We have them in communities like Plainfield, Barrie, all over this. Even in Stowe, you have these buildings. So giving money to just to have those owners have a reason to fix them up 
so that they can come on as rentals. Middle income programs that VHFA has. Senior housing, we need housing for adults with disabilities. It's a, bi it's a big problem. So there's all these different niche, niche parts of housing that we need to build. And together, all those can need to equal these big, big numbers that we need to do. And it's a national problem. If, if it was only permitting, you wouldn't see this problem in Montana, Washington, Nevada, everywhere. Um, but the only other thing I was going to say is, so to be clear, I don't want to say people, have people say I didn't say this. So I'm, I support a raising the marginal income on those over $500,000 for the next five years, do a 3% surcharge that only funds housing. So we just, because we need to raise like 25 to 75 million a year to really make the difference. And I think those that are, have incomes over 500,000 can pay that 3%. That would raise the kind of money we have and then we go back after five years once we've got all that money in the pipeline. Thank you, Andrew. Ian Watson. Thank you. Uh, so having sat on the Natural Resources and Energy Committee and been a part of the uh, group that reformed uh, the uh, Act 250 in the most recent bill, um, one of the things that we heard from developers particularly was that the barriers for them was not uh, necessarily the uh, the Act 250 process itself as much as it was the appeals. Uh, they were very worried about the appeal process taking a significant amount of time. And that uh, resulted in, in us uh, adding more judges uh, so that the process could just go faster, right? So if we could reduce the, uh, the length of the appeals, that was going to help. So that's something that was a part of that bill. And uh, the other thing too is it did reduce the, um, the amount of um, duplication that developers would have to go through if they were building in places that had uh, robust, uh, zoning laws um, on their own, and that was even gradated. So it was not just uh, for the downtowns, but in places that had either water or sewer, there was going to be some um, loosening of the the kinds of restrictions, so that uh, places uh, could uh, have a little bit more flexibility to build, uh, uh, even if they they didn't have like a, a fully r robust set of zoning rules. Um, the other thing I think is worth mentioning is, as Senator Persick said, the other barrier that we heard from folks was was money, because building uh, housing is just so expensive right now. And so I, I am certainly glad that we've put uh, as much money as we have towards housing. I think we need, need to continue to prioritize that in our budget with programs like VHIP um, and, and others, you know, uh, specialized housing, um, as Senator Perchlick mentioned. Uh, but, uh, and I, I also want to say that I, I support that um, uh, program that uh, he was mentioning about taxing those who make over five hundred thousand uh, dollars. You know, as we said, the um, average working and middle class Vermonter can't pr uh, provide anymore, but there are some people who can. So we should be asking them to pay more. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> For closing statements, we'll start with Donald and Ann Cummings. Will go second. Reminder: the closing statements are one minute. It would be helpful if everybody could stick to that since we're already after 8 o'clock. So, Donald. So I'm running to make things more affordable in Vermont, support the governor, help sustain his vetoes. Uh, I think he's working very hard for us, and his vetoes have been very reasonable. Uh, Supermajority on either side of the aisle is, does not make for good decision-making, and we need more balance. Um, I will listen to the people. I will engage with the people. I'll get to know them uh, in the entire district. And uh, I won't forget who I'm sent to represent. My website is donaldkochforvt.org. And my email address is kochforvermont, spelled out, dot com. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Ann Cummings, to be followed by Andrew. Okay. Thank you for coming out to listen to us tonight. Um, I would like to go back because I think we've heard tonight these are not simple issues. There's, you know, many different moving parts and the challenge for democracy, and I am there because I believe in democracy, is for all of us to come together and to put our heads together and to find a way 
to address all of these issues that works for all of us. I've raised four children. I have six grandchildren. Two of them are in Barry Towns. No, one's in Spalding now. Um, I have two in Swanton, and my daughter's on the school board there. I, um, I am a part of this community. I love this community. I've come up through local government, and I would like to continue to be able to work on those problems and to work with you as we move ourselves forward. Thank you, Ann. Andrew, to be followed by Mike Deering. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to thank you all for coming out and listening and participating in our democracy. And thanks to the League of Women Voters for, for putting this on. And thanks for the, the college Republicans or the Republican of Northfield that had the first idea to have this. I think it's important to have these. We don't have enough on, on elections. I think that's critical. Uh, I also want to thank all the other candidates. It's not easy to be a candidate always, and it, I think we all agree that we want a better Vermont, even though we might disagree on the ways of getting there, and I just am really glad that in Washington County, at least all the times I've run, we've had a full slate of candidates, so you've had full choices for your three votes. There are many other places in Vermont, when you go to vote, you do not have a choice. You just have the incumbent and nobody else. So I think that is, bodes well for, for our district, and look forward to hearing more, talking to you more uh, be between now and the election. Thank you, Andrew. Mike Deering to be followed by Ann Watson. My name is Michael Deering II, and I'm running to be your next Washington County Senator. Because to me, in August, we didn't have those choices, that we didn't have more than four choices on that ballot. But people made a decision that they wanted more choices. And I'm one of those candidates that they decided that they wanted another choice with. So with that, I humbly accepted. Because like many of you, I feel that what's gone on over the last two years is not okay. We're not listening. We're not understanding what our people are telling them. So I decided to get myself in the game. Because like I tell everyone else, Identify the problem, get in there. You need to be the change that you want to see. So with that, I'm running as hard as I possibly can to represent you all in the Washington County Senate District. If you want to get a hold of me, my cell phone number, 802-461-3231. It's out there for everyone. I've been serving in the Barry City Council three years like that. Thank you, Mike. Ian Watson to be followed by Mike Doyle. Thank you. So I hope that you've heard through my answers this evening that I'm a very solutions-oriented person. I'm very thoughtful and very creative. Um, I teach high school physics. So one of the things that I like to think about is how we have the laws of the universe that we can't change, but the laws that we have for ourselves, we can. And that these are the structures that we have built for ourselves that are totally uh, within our power to, to manage and make work better for ourselves and for our society. So I'm looking forward to working on property taxes climate action, and building more housing. Um, I have more than 10 years of experience in uh, local politics and have experience uh, in the Senate. And I am asking for one of your three votes. And again, my name is Ann Watson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ann. Mike Doyle. At least three people tonight acknowledged uh, Senator Bill Doyle. I would like to close with that. I and Bill Doyle are not related. It's been a lot of fun having the same name as Bill Doyle. Bill Doyle, if you knew him as well as I did, believed in three things. Civility, and I think we achieved that tonight. Volunteerism. Thank you all of the people who put this together. And a quiet but strong sense of patriotism. We celebrate that tonight with this assembly. 
I think America is a wonderful country for this reason. Thank you, Mike. Before I turn this back over to Sue Racanelli, would you please join me in thanking Ann Cummings, Michael Deering II, Mike, uh, Michael Mike Doyle, uh, Donald T. Koch, Andrew Perchlick, and Ann Watson for putting themselves out there and for offering to represent Washington County in the Vermont Senate. We are delighted that you joined us this evening and hope that this forum gave you the opportunity to learn more about your candidates for the Washington County State Senate. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank the candidates for their response to a wide range of questions. Our co-sponsor, Norwich University Political Science Club, Orca Media for live streaming and recording this forum, Northfield Middle and High School for graciously hosting us, our moderator, Tom McCone, our volunteers, and you, our audience, and viewers, for your interest in this election. The League would like to remind you to vote on Tuesday, November the 5th. Ballots have been mailed to all active voters. If you have not received your ballot, please contact your town clerk. You can vote your ballot early by mailing it to your town clerk by October 25th, dropping it off at a ballot drop box or at your town clerk's office, or taking it to your polling place on election day. You will need to re-register if you have moved or if you have changed your name. If you want to know more about your candidates, the League has a nonpartisan voter's guide at vote411.org. Every vote counts, and we know this to be the case in Vermont. So we urge you to make the effort, make a decision, make a difference, vote. And thank you for coming here today, and have a good night. Thank you all.